Well, hello everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse, and if you are new to what we do, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Now, this is my last hosting gig of the entire school year. We have done over 500 programs since September, featuring some of the coolest scientists, explorers, conservationists around the globe, and it's been such a thrill in, again, strange times, bringing you these amazing stories and having your classrooms join us. So I, I know we've got a, a pretty good audience today, but for absolutely everyone all year long, it's been such a pleasure and privilege having you guys join us. Now, today isn't just a normal day. Today is a very special day. Today is the capstone of our Oceans Week Canada extravaganza of programs. Now, all week long, we've been partnering with all sorts of amazing speakers, scientists, and more. We have learned about eDNA and Oceans Week Canada. We talked about songs of the Arctic Ocean, and we were joined by Kate Musset out in Victoria about the incredible work linking in Indigenous knowledge and scientific understanding. Now, this series is just part of a much broader nationwide effort, 100 plus live and virtual programs. We've got learning resources and hubs. You can check all that out at oceanweekcan.ca, and I really hope you take the opportunity to do so. Now, for me, growing up, my biggest inspiration was books. I love the written word and I love it as a means of sharing stories in a really captivating and entrancing way. And so there's no better person to cap off our Ocean Week extravaganza than our speaker today. We are doing live by Rochelle Strauss and she is going to talk to us today about and from her new global ocean book. We're going to learn a little bit about why the oceans are so important, some of the amazing species that live in them, what we can do to help protect them and just change our mindsets a little to think about the oceans in a new way, wherever we might be joining from across the continent today. So without further ado, I'm so excited to bring in Rochelle to have a little fun with us, and I can't wait for your questions at the end. Rochelle, thank you so, so much for joining us today, and welcome to Ocean Week Canada. Woo! <laughs> Woo thank you. <laughs> well, I want to turn it over to you. You're the star of our show today, so feel free to dive right in with that presentation, and uh, can't wait to, to hear more. Awesome, Jesse. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for having me today. I love, 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 of course, biased as I am, that your biggest influence was books, because that was probably my biggest influence growing up as well. Uh, my mom was obsessed with Jacques Cousteau. And so when I was growing up, we had every Jacques Cousteau book in our house. And I'm pretty sure that's how I learned how to read by looking at the pictures and being capt captivated by the species that were there um, and, and reading the descriptions underneath. I also grew up watching every, I'm not going to date myself, but every Sunday night, Mutual of Omaha, Wildlife Kingdom, and all those other wonderful um, plant and animal specials that I got to see at night on Sunday night dinners was uh, a treat for me and really inspired me. But for sure, it was the books. Um, so I'm very honored to be here. The capstone presentation of Ocean Week. It's been a crazy week, and I hope everyone's had a chance to do something about the ocean, to think about the ocean. Maybe you've learned about a new species this week, or maybe you've done an activity that would protect the ocean. That would be awesome. I'm very excited today to talk to you a little bit about the global ocean, but before we start, I do wanna do uh, share with you that I am speaking to you from Toronto, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many First Nations Inuit and Métis people. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. And as an educator and a writer, I make a commitment every day to continue to, continue to learn and act for equity. So who am I? Well, I'm a writer and I'm an educator. I'm insanely curious and I love to learn. And a little known fact about me is that I have worked at almost every major tourist attraction in Toronto. I've worked at the Royal Ontario Museum, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the CN Tower back when there was an environmental exhibit at the top of the tower. I worked briefly at the Toronto Zoo and I've worked at the Ontario Science Centre. And through my work, I've had the amazing opportunity and chance to meet with some incredibly smart people, researchers and scientists who have taught me and inspired me so much. And it's part of what has fueled my interest in continuing to share what I'm learning with others. As an explorer, I love to be outside. I love hiking through natural spaces. I love discovering new species of plants and animals. And I love learning more about the world around me and seeing the world around me. My eyes and my ears are always open, waiting for the unexpected and seeking out old friends and new friends. 
And because I'm a storyteller, I love sharing the stories of what I see, what I discover, and what I learn. I'm passionate about protecting the planet. And as an author, I want to inspire readers to learn and discover more about Earth and the incredible species who call Earth home. My goal is to change the world one book at a time. I've written three books so far, and if I can get my slide deck to work, there we go. The Tree of Life, The Incredible Biodiversity of Life on Earth, One Well, The Story of Water on Earth, and my latest one, The Global Ocean. Hopefully you've seen at least a couple of these in the library. Maybe you've even read some of these before. I'd love to hear your feedback on them. But I'm also a wee bit obsessed about the ocean. And this is a picture of me in my natural habitat, which is where I wanna be more than anywhere else in the world is in, by, or near the ocean, which is somewhat ironic considering I grew up in Montreal and I live in Toronto, which is not near an ocean. But I do spend most of my days thinking about strategizing how to get back to the ocean and learning more about the ocean. I'm always happiest when I'm near there. And among my favorite species in the global ocean are cetaceans, so whales and dolphins, as well as cephalopods, which includes uh, squids and octopus. I'm rather fond of sharks and rays. And of course, seahorses make me laugh and giddy. But I'm also really fond of these wee little sea slugs called nudibranchs. They are some of the most vibrant animals in the ocean and they amaze me. I strongly encourage all of you to take a look at some of these species that I've talked about, but also start thinking about the species you love the most and learn more about the ones that interest you and intrigue you. But I wanna to talk to you now about the global ocean. I knew I wanted to write about the ocean. Obviously, I was really passionate about the ocean and uh, I lived learning and diving into books about the ocean, but there was so much to talk about. I wasn't sure where to start. But it actually all started ironically with a duck, about 28,000 of them, in fact. In 1992, a shipping container was traveling from Hong Kong to Washington State, and one of the cargo ships was washed over shore, over the board, overboard, and it sprung open and it released 28,000 rubber ducks into the Pacific Ocean. Now, that's a little bit of an environmental issue, absolutely. But what was interesting about the rubber ducks is over the next 20 years, they washed up on shore all across the world. They were even found frozen in the Arctic ice. And these rubber ducks became a real life science experiment that helped scientists prove their theories about the global ocean and prove their theories about the ocean currents. They also provided a real life example of how the global ocean is connected. So while there are five major oceans, each of those oceans is actually interconnected. And the fact that those ducks escaped into the Pacific, but then were found all over the world was a great reminder to us how the global ocean is all connected, how all of those oceans are all connected. So that was the inspiration or the beginning. It's, it was the hook that pulled the story together. So I'm gonna start right now and read you at least from the first page of the global ocean and then we'll talk a little bit more about some of the issues impacting the oceans and the things that you can do or the things that are happening to protect the global ocean, but also things that you can do. And, and I'm going to encourage everyone to get involved in protecting the global ocean. So we'll start with the first page. Earth's beating heart. What if Earth had a beating heart that powered everything on the planet? In a way, the global ocean is like Earth's heart. When you look on a map of the world, you see five great oceans, the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Arctic Ocean, and the Southern Ocean, which is also called the Antarctic Ocean. But what you may not realize is that these oceans are all linked by a system of water that moves between them. So these five oceans are actually connected to form one single circulating ocean, the global ocean. This global ocean is Earth's most important feature. It moves heat, oxygen, and nutrients around the planet, supporting all life on Earth, much like your heart pumps blood through your body to move oxygen and nutrients. It is also home to more species and more habitats than anywhere else on the planet. Its water shapes Earth's climate and influences its weather. 
The global ocean stores carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and supplies oxygen for us to breathe. It is also a source of food for many of Earth's inhabitants living in the ocean and on land. And for humans, it provides food, energy, minerals, and transportation, as well as a place to play, explore, and enjoy. A healthy global ocean is what keeps the planet flourishing and sustains all life on Earth, just like the beat of your heart keeps you alive and well. But the global ocean is in trouble. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit more about the global ocean, and then we'll talk a little bit about what's happening to the global ocean. And you may not know this, but the global ocean is actually home to the highest peaks, deepest valleys, and longest mountain chains found anywhere on Earth. And in fact, the global ocean is so deep that you could put Mount Everest in its deepest part and it would still cover Mount Everest. The global ocean is also home to the richest diversity on Earth. There are more different types of species living in the ocean than anywhere else. And it's home to the greatest number of species. Scientists say there's about 50% of all life on Earth lives in the ocean, but they predict that that could be as much as 80% because we've barely started to study the global ocean. And the ocean is home to more different habitats than anywhere else on Earth. There's coral reefs and mangrove forests, seagrass shores, there's intertidal zones, that's where the ocean meets land, there's kelp forests, there's so many more. It's just an array of incredible habitat and diversity. The global ocean also holds 90% of all the water on Earth. So we talk about Earth being a watery planet, and if you look at Earth from space, you see it looks like a blue marble. We've all seen that picture. But the ocean actually holds 97% of all that water on Earth. And that water is always on the move through the water cycle and through water currents. So water in the global ocean is always moving between land, and the ocean, and the atmosphere. So I know most of you probably know a little bit about the water cycle, but just to make sure, the water cycle is when water from the ocean or water from Earth evaporates and it becomes a water vapor and it rises into the sky. And as it rises into the sky, it cools and condensation happens and the vapor turns back to raindrops, tiny little raindrops. And these raindrops collide with one another and get bigger and bigger until they're heavy enough that they fall back down to the Earth and they refill the lakes and rivers. And of course, those lakes and rivers flow back into the ocean. And this water cycle is happening all the time. It's a constant, constant cycle. So that's one way the water is cycled across the globe and cycled um, through the water cycle. And those clouds also move across the planet. So the water that may evaporate from the Pacific Ocean, those clouds might move over and rain down somewhere else on the, on the Earth. But the water also moves through water currents. And these currents in the ocean are formed by wind, gravity, and the rotation of the Earth. And some of these currents flow across the surface of the ocean. Some of these currents flow deep, deep, deep beneath the ocean. And some of these currents flow from the surface to the depths and then back up again. So there's a vertical current. Then these currents move water. They bring warm water from the tropics to the poles. And then they bring colder water from the poles to the tropics. They also move nutrients from one ocean basin to another. The global ocean is Earth's most important feature. But human activities are having a huge impact on the global ocean. And today, as I said, I want to talk to you a little bit more about what is harming the global ocean, what people are doing to protect the global ocean, because while the news might be bad, there are some amazing things happening, and what you can do as well. So we'll start by talking about perhaps one of the biggest issues, which is climate change, of course. <clears throat> and the crazy thing about climate and the ocean is that they're completely interconnected. You cannot have one without the other. The global ocean controls climate and weather, and, the cli and then climate change further impacts the ocean. So remember how I said that the currents move warm water from the tropics to the poles and from cold water from the poles to the tropics? Well, this helps shape our weather and rainfall patterns, even the amount of storms all around the world. But what you may not realize is that the global ocean also absorbs heat and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So I want you to think about that for a little bit. We know that the atmosphere is getting warmer and we know that there's more CO2 in the atmosphere, carbon dioxide. 
So if the global ocean also absorbs heat from the atmosphere and carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, what happens? Well, as the earth gets warmer, the global ocean starts absorbing more heat from the atmosphere, which means the water in the global ocean will get warmer. And warmer weather, or sorry, warmer water changes the currents. It could impact the types of storms that we have, even the severity of the storms. Warmer water can also ca cause more flooding, which can erode shorelines. And warmer water, of course, threatens plants and animals because many of the plants and animals in the ocean are adapted to specific conditions in the ocean. So if the ocean gets warmer, it changes the conditions. And many of those plants and animals may not be able to move or change locations. But I want you to think back to what the other piece that I said, which was also that the global ocean absorbs carbon dioxide. And I'm sure you've heard of the term carbon sink. And when we think about carbon sinks, we often think about forests, rainforests, or we think about kelp forests or mangrove forests. They're all carbon sinks as well. They absorb CO2, carbon dioxide, from the atmosphere. But you may not realize that the ocean also absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. So the more CO2 there is in the atmosphere, the more CO2 will be absorbed by the ocean. And right now, scientists are saying that they are that the ocean absorbs about one third of all the CO2 in the atmosphere. So more CO2 in the atmosphere means more CO2 in the ocean. And that could cause the ocean to get more acidic. Now, the truth is you and I, if we were going for a swim at the beach one day, would probably never notice the subtleties of a more acidic ocean. But you know that plants and animals will, because remember I said they're uniquely adapted to the conditions of the ocean where they live. So if the water chemistry changes and more CO2 is in the water, it will absolutely have a huge impact on plants and animals. And of course, I don't need to tell you about pollution and the huge effect it's having on uh, the species and plants in the and all the all the species in the global ocean. Every year, billions of kilograms of trash ends up in the ocean. And this garbage includes abandoned fishing gear, chemicals, oil, pesticides, even light and noise pollution have an impact on the global ocean. And pollution in all its forms will ha will harm habitats and species. But the pollution that we is probably having the greatest impact on the global ocean is plastic. And I'm sure you've heard all about the issues of plastic in the global ocean. I want you to take a moment wherever you are, if you're at home or if you're at school, and look around. Look around your classroom, look around your bedroom, look around your living room, wherever you are. No matter where you look, I bet you can spot dozens of different things in your home or in your school that are made of plastic. We use plastic for everything in so many different ways. And unfortunately, that plastic is finding its way into the global ocean. In fact, they estimate that about 80% of the garbage in the global ocean is probably plastic. And this plastic never goes away. Plastic isn't compost compostable. So while the sun and the current might break it down, it just gets broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. And then what happens to this plastic? Well, larger pieces of plastic can destroy habitats. Animals can get tangled up in it. They can also choke on it. And animals can also mistake plastic for food. Microplastic, so as the plastics get broken down into smaller and smaller pieces, they become little tiny, tiny microscopic plastic beads. Well, those look like fish eggs. And plastic bags look like yummy jellyfish to sea turtles. And I know that might be hard to believe, but I want to tell you a story I was at the uh, Vancouver Aquarium several years ago and there was an exhibit and they had side by side two aquariums with a current flowing in the aquarium. And in one aquarium, they had jellyfish. And in another aquarium, they had plastic bags. And I have pretty good eyes, despite my glasses, I can see pretty clearly. And even I had trouble telling the difference between the tank with the jellyfish and the tank with the plastic bag. So imagine how difficult it would be for the average sea creature like a turtle. They won't necessarily tell the difference. And since plastic can't be digested, animals that eat plastic will start to feel full, but the plastic can't be digested and the plastic has no nutritional value. So if the animal starts feeling full, they might stop eating. The plastic can also poison the animals and then that poison can move its way up the food chain 
as different species eat the animals that have eaten the plastic. Crazy thing is, the plastic, that plastic itself is definitely an issue that we can do some work on to solve. There are nearly 8 billion people on the planet, and fish is the primary source of food for nearly one third of all the people. So to keep up with the demand, we are taking more and more fish from the global ocean and taking them faster than ever before. And it's not just the number of fish we're taking or how quickly we're taking them, them that's the problem. It's also the way we fish. Some of the fishing practices that we use actually destroy habitats as they, as they drag large dredgers across the bottom of the ocean, tearing up whatever habitat is in front of them to catch whatever it is they're fishing for. And every year, billions of unwanted marine species are accidentally caught in fishing nets. And this is, this is called bycatch, and it could be unintended fish, but it could also be sharks and whales and turtles and even birds that are getting caught up in the nets. Thankfully, scientists and researchers and innovators are developing better fishing practices. And I'll tell you a good news story in a little bit around that. But humans are also changing the coastline. We're building along the shorelines, we're destroying habitats like mangrove forests and seagrass beds and wetlands. And remember I said earlier, things like mangrove forests and kelp forests are also carbon sinks. So as we destroy the coastline, we're still destroying carbon sinks. And not only are these habitats important for plants and animals and other species, they're also barriers. They protect the water from a road or they, as, as barriers between water and land, they'll protect the water from anything that's running off the land, but they'll also protect the land from erosion. So losing these barriers, losing these natural ecosystems along the shorelines can be very detrimental to Earth, but also, of course, to the global ocean. So as you see, the global ocean is so much more than the water you see. It's the beating heart that supports all life on Earth. It's the air we breathe, the climate we live in, and home to the richest diversity of species on the planet. We need to protect the global ocean so that it can continue to support all life on Earth, including us. And thankfully, people around the world are stepping up and taking action to protect the global ocean. And I call these actions ripples of change. And these, for me, are the good news stories. So as I'm learning more and more about the ocean and I'm learning more and more about what's happening to the ocean, I look for the good news stories. I look for the ripples of change because the ripples of change are what gives me hope. And one of those ripples is something called marine protected areas. And MPAs are like national parks, but in the ocean. And there's a global goal right now to set aside 30% of the global ocean and designate it as an MPA by 2030. And that's only eight years from now. So within eight years, 30% of the global ocean could be designated as a marine protected area, which would be amazing. There's another great initiative. It's called the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. It's a bit of a mouthful for sure, but this includes a group of countries, governments, and even people in the fishing industry who are collecting abandoned and lost fishing gear from the ocean. They then use this abandoned and lost gear and recycle it and turn it into skateboards and running shoes, even sunglasses. So it's a way to get the gear out of the ocean and not just put it in landfill, but actually make something of it. And then you may have heard of Ocean, Con Ocean Conservancy International, and every year they host a shoreline cleanup in September where millions of people from around the world volunteer to pick up litter from their local beaches. They keep millions of kilograms of garbage from entering the global ocean. And if you think about it, that's a community initiative. On one day in September, millions and millions of people around the world are working to protect the global ocean. And of course, there's lots of work being done around habitat restoration. There's a group in the UK that are actually trying to regrow seagrass meadows. So they go out and plant seagrass seeds and beds and try to regrow the shoreline. And as I said, I talked a little bit earlier about new fishing techniques. This is one of my favorite. This is called a TED or a turtle extruder device. And what was happening is the 
nets would go out to catch fish and then the turtles would follow the fish into the nets and of course they'd get trapped. Well, you'll see that they put a couple of little bars in the net and then they created a trap door for the turtle to escape. So if the turtle swims its way in to try and find the fish, it then can escape when it hits the dead end. The fish still get caught, but the turtle is protected. So these are among some of my favorite things, but there are many more stories in my book about the ripples of change. And my question to you now is, what's your wave? Because even you have a role to play. You can reduce or eliminate uh, plastics. You can say no to single use plastic. You can walk or bike to school instead of driving to keep CO2 out of the atmosphere. You can join a shoreline cleanup or even plan a shoreline cleanup. And you don't have to wait till September. You can do that any day of the year. And of course, you can learn more because the more we know about the ocean, the more we can do to protect it. So I encourage you to think about your wave. And in fact, I'm going to leave you with a challenge. And this is my challenge to you. I'm going to encourage you, every one of you, to do one thing to protect the global ocean sometime this week. Perhaps you can get it done before the 12th, which is Sunday, and, and celebrate Ocean Week by taking some action. But I'm going to encourage you to do one thing, no matter how big or how small, one thing to protect the global ocean. But here's the catch, because there's always a catch. I want you to do one thing, but I want you to tell two people. And I want you to encourage them to do one thing and for them to tell two people. So you're doing one thing could lead to two more people doing one thing. And if those two people take the challenge, then four more people are doing something. And if those four people take the challenge, then we've got eight more people. And if those eight people take on the challenge, we get 16 more people and then 32 more people and then 64 more people. And that could continue going on forever. Those are the ripples of change. And those ripples of change will become a wave. And those ripples only happen if you start something. So you have the power to start a ripple of change and build that ripple and that ripple will grow and grow and grow until we have a wave of change. And I certainly hope you will all take me up on the challenge. And if you want, I would love to hear about your ripples and the ripples you're doing to protect the global ocean. Um, I think Jesse's going to put the, the banner in, the, in here as well, but you can follow me on Instagram or on my website. I love hearing about the stories. I love hearing about the action. And I love seeing the ripples of change happening. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michelle. What a fantastic program. And I, I certainly hope our students today take that inspiration, go out and try and create those own ripples of change. I know this week for myself, and this counts as my telling two people, I've been uh, taking reusable bags to all my grocery stores. I've been not buying things like plastic water bottles and taking reusable containers instead when I go on hikes. I picked up some trash when I was last in the park, which, you know, if it makes it to a lake, it makes it to the ocean. Those are all small things that we can do. Choose sustainable seafood when you get that opportunity. And this is something that a lot of our partners have been talking about throughout Ocean Week. So uh, a bevy of opportunities to be excited about nature and to make a positive difference. And I'm so glad your book emphasizes those things so, so much. Um, and yes, I, I will share this at the end of the broadcast as well, but uh, just to have it in banner form officially for the YouTube viewers in the future, uh, RochelleStrauss.com and at Rochelle Strauss author uh, on Instagram. I really encourage our students to check those out. Uh, but yes, as you said, let's dive in with Q&A. So Ms. Fisher's class, you guys can share in the chat on the side. The rest of classes, I'll come to you guys live in just a second. Take a second to put those thinking caps on. But I wanted to start with a question of my own because underpinning your book, sort of as this backdrop and all these beautiful pictures, were beautiful pictures. You had great art emphasizing and showcasing these ecosystems and the solutions and more. How do you end up with artists like that? And why is that so important to the stories that you're trying to tell? Oh, that's a great question, Jesse. Um, it's an interesting uh, uh, technique that the publishers often use is that the writer writes the book and the illustrator illustrates the book and never the two shall meet. Um, we give feedback. Uh, I can talk about the um, aesthetics and if the species itself is correct, but it's actually the uh, publisher that selects the illustrator. Usually I'll get a, a portfolio of a dozen, maybe eight different illustrators. 
in this case, Natasha Donovan's illustrations were just breathtaking. And, and I'll, if you'll allow me, I'll tell you a quick story about this. Please. She is um, a, an incredible illustrator on the West Coast, which also happens to be my favorite coast. I love the rugged ocean coastline there. And the first time I got illustrations from her, the first illustrations are usually what we call thumbnails and they're black and white. And the illustrations came and, and I have to tell you, when I handed Kids Can Press the book, I was like, oh, good luck with that. I don't know how you're gonna figure out how to illustrate this. And she came back with these black and white illustrations that had me in tears. And the greatest story was the page that I showed with the climate change about climate change that was of the Arctic. It was all in black and white. And of course I immediately recognized there's, we've got a polar bear and we've got a narwhal and we've got walruses, great. And in the corner was a seal and it had stripes on it. And I was blown away that she had actually gone to the trouble to do the research to discover, um, a, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank, the striped seal, the ribbon seal, sorry, there we go, the ribbon seal. She had actually done the research to make sure that the species were so accurate and it just blew me away and made me so excited. So every time, every new iteration of the book, every new iteration of the illustrations to see the detail that she put in and the species, and even that she happened to capture some of my most favorite species, it wasn't because I asked her to. She just, it's like she was in my head. She was just there. So it was so nice to see uh, an illustrator who had the same passion for the content as I did. Amazing, what a great story. Um, and ribbon seals are super cool, by the way. Everyone should look those up when they're done this broadcast. They're very, very neat. Um, all right, uh, Miss Fisher's group, wondering if all the rubber ducks were recovered. So all these ducks that end up in the ocean world, did we find them all, did we track them down, or are they still out there somewhere? Uh, we did not find them all, as far as I know. They are, they, I don't think there's been one found for a few years. I think it was for about 20 years they were finding them. Um, I do have a goal and I'm putting it out there in the universe. I would love to have one of those rubber ducks because it had such an inspiration and, and uh, for my story, but no, I don't believe that they have found them all. No, so I mean, that's the thing. If one of our students goes out and they're doing something nice in the ocean, they find one of those ducks to just send them to Rochelle. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, Blue Review School, I wanna head to you guys right now. So Ms. Bradshaw's group, if you wanna uh, unmute your mic, turn on your camera again, uh, come say hello and, and take a question. I don't know if you're still there, what the deal is. We got a whole bunch of classes with devices doing funny things today. So Miss Collins class, I can check in with you guys if you have a question for us uh, in Guelph grade threes. Uh, yeah, your mic's on, you're good to go. Hey guys. All right, so um, one of the girls in our class would like to know uh, before the fishing nets were um, adjusted, how many turtles on average were you catching in those um, nets for the fish? That is a great question. And I don't have that answer on hand, but I, I think somewhere I can, I can certainly get a stat for how much bycatch. And in fact, it might even be in my research notes. Um, but the amount of bycatch is, this is significantly higher than you would imagine. I don't, I couldn't do um, specifically for turtles. Jesse, you might have the stats uh, on hand, but I, I don't have them with me. For turtles, it's really hard to know. I know that those devices have been radically effective. We've talked about that in some of our programs before, but just by virtue of bycatch in general, so unintended things that you're catching in nets, uh, World Wildlife Fund has it 40% of global wow. fishery catch is bycatch. So 40% of the things that we get in nets are things that we don't want, that they throw back, that uh, you know have no business being caught in the first place, which is why on a positive note, we're starting to see so many means of making sure that we don't have that problem. I mean, you're always going to catch some things that you don't want, but uh, making sure that that's as limited a problem and issue as possible is a really important thing that global fisheries are tackling. So I, I love that question. Uh, actually, ironically enough, right at this exact minute, we're having a program with the Turtle Hospital too as sort of a double feature to wrap <laughs> up. Uh, they're in Marathon, Florida. So if you want to check out that YouTube video after, you might well get that answer. Um, Rochelle, what is your inspiration for the individual topics is there something specific that drove this one is there a next book for you maybe that you got down the road i know this one's just fairly well released but i'm curious what your thoughts are <laughs> well the, the first question yes there is a next book i'm currently writing one as we speak um it will become it will come out in august 2024 also about water i'm not going to give too much away but yep i'm uh, i got a heavy writing weekend ahead of me this weekend but my inspiration is just my passion for nature. I really, um, I love the stories, the stories of interconne interconnection, the story of species and spaces and how they all work together, how everything in nature is connected. You can't have one without the other, that, that balance, that, 
that idea of you pull one string here and, and so many are going to get pulled over here and you have no idea what they're going to be. I love that. So for me, it's like following a puzzle. I love learning more and I love exploring and I love discovering new species. So I'm always ready to dive into it. Um, the interesting thing about the global ocean is when I wrote one well, which was quite a while ago, Kids Can had asked me to pitch a book about water. And of course, my inclination was to pitch probably a dozen different stories about the ocean. And, and that one never took off. And needless to say, I'm, I'm very delighted with one well. It's done incredibly well and, and has shaped a, a lot of minds and is an unimportant book. Uh, but I was very happy to finally get my ocean book out because that has been a, a huge dream for me for a long time. Good for you. That's so exciting. Um, Ms. Collins class, she wrote on the chat, uh, any advice your budding authors? We've got kids that want to write one day. Uh, How do they get started with that? <laughs> keep writing. Um, play with words. I love playing with words. And sometimes it they don't go anywhere. But if you're listening and you're hearing to people talk or you hear new words and you kind of string different words together, just write them in a notebook. Again, it might not be a story. And it might come back 10 years from now and you go, oh, those two words pair really well together. I encourage you to keep writing, uh, even if it's not a book or even if it's not going anywhere, just to write your thoughts, just to play with words, just to have fun. And then the other piece is to keep your eyes and ears open to the world because there are so many stories, whether you're writing stories about nature or stories about people or just stories about a city and how the city moves. They're, the stories in the world are amazing. And if your eyes and ears are open, you're going to see stories that other people won't see. And, the, and you'll know the right story to tell when it hits you. I love that note. That was some really practical advice. That's nice. And I appreciate that immensely. Now, a question that I know you've gotten 8,000 million times, and that's probably an exact figure. Um, you mentioned nudibranchs earlier. We talked about octopus before the program got underway. Do you have favorite species? plural uh, in the oceans that uh, we can share with our students to encourage them to learn more. I absolutely have favorite species, of course, but uh, it's, I can't pick one. So I love humpbacks. Mm -hmm. yes. I love orcas. Um, you saw a picture of one of them there, a flamboyant cuttlefish uh, are, are very amazing. Decorator crabs blow me away all the time. Um, and uh, weedy and leafy sea dragons are among my favorite. And I have a crazy thing for barnacles. I just think barnacles are so neat. <laughs> that is an unusual one. The others I've heard before. So for our students, this is our, our chance for a nerdy conversation. Charles Darwin, of course, famous for On the Origin of Species, before he wrote that book, spent seven years studying and learning everything on barnacles. To this day, I believe, like the all-time <laughs> greatest expert of barnacles. And he spent so long in them but that by the end, he wrote, I hate a barnacle as no man ever has before, <laughs> which is one of my very favorite stories of a biologist in the, the wild, so to speak. Oh, dear. Uh, Rochelle, you know, you, you learn so much, you get the chance to reach out to experts, talk with people. Are there places you'd really like to go or sort of do with that firsthand exploration and, and go diving or, or go snorkeling? Or oh, yes, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Everywhere. Um, yeah. my, my, I would love to go to the Arctic. Um, yeah. I, have, I daydream about seeing narwhals in the wild uh, one day, hopefully. Um, I do love, there's a, there's a beach in Curacao called La Playa, Playa Laguna that I love snorkeling at. I, I call it like, uh, it's like a nursery. It's a little, uh, alcove and you just walk in up to your ankles and put on your fins and go and everything is there. It's, it's astounding and beautiful. That picture of me snorkeling is actually from Curacao. Cool. Um, and I do love the California coast and I'm heading there, uh, first week of July and hope, hopefully meet some of my friends from Monterey Bay research aquarium, research Institute and from the aquarium and uh, grill, the, grill them a little bit more and learn more because I'm always looking for opportunities to learn from the experts out there. Two things, we did a bunch of programs earlier this year with Shannon Johnson from Monterey Bay and uh, oh, I can't for the life of me remember his name right now, but we did some just really, really fun stuff. That is one of the elite research institutions in the world. So for Absolutely. Audience, you want to check out some great stuff and California Coast, I always like highlighting this because today technically is our big shark day. We're doing a bunch of other shark programs. So there was a drone photographer that went to the LA beaches and just took footage of the beach and the things that were swimming around people and basically found that all the time, every day, there are great white sharks around people constantly. They swim between people, they're 10 feet away. And the message of that was is that so many people think sharks and terrifying, especially great whites. And here they were every day in one of the most popular beach areas in the world, 
uh, and wanted nothing to do with people. If anything, they swam away or were just vaguely curious, but certainly not attacking people. So it's such a cool opportunity to go to that coast. And uh, I hope you have a, a marvelous time with everyone down there. It's very, very cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Hopefully I'll sneak in some whale watching in there. Or, or last time I was there, the whales, we were on a pier and the whales were in the harbor. So. <laughs> oh. That's so special. I hope you get your narwhal experience in life. I've had belugas live in the wild. That's a really special oh, thing. Belugas so. is up there too. I, I uh, uh, Hopefully in the next couple of years, go to Saguenay and Tadoussac and spend some time with the belugas. Churchill, worst case, when in Churchill, there was like 200 around the boat. And oh. like, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, alone in the boat. Very, very cool. Um, we're at the 40 minute mark. Time flies and you're having fun, students. So Michelle, is there like a, a final message you want to share with our kids to inspire them to keep the learning going, learn more about your books, get involved? I'll leave up your website and banner on the bottom, but if there's anything jumps to mind, do share. I think the most important thing for me to share right now is just a reminder that I, you know, we have we have students in so many different grades and so many different ages uh, with us today. It really doesn't matter how old you are you actually have a, the power to make a difference. And I encourage you to try and think about that. Whether you're selling cookies and raising money for an environmental organization you support, or whether you're figuring out what you want to advocate for and becoming an advocate, or an artist or a writer, or maybe even consider a career in blue economy or green careers, something that's sustainable, you actually have the power to make the difference. And that domino exercise that I showed you earlier it's not just hypothetical, that's real. Your actions will have an impact and your actions will influence other people. You don't have to be on TV to do it. You don't have to be a big voice in, in a newspaper to do it or online to do it. Even just living your life day to day with an eye towards conservation and protection will influence the people around you and that domino effect, that, those ripples of change are gonna happen. So I strongly encourage folks out there to, to start making some ripples and uh, let's watch the wave of change happen. I could not think of a better message to wrap up with that. Now, Rochelle, I think you know you and I both are so excited to see this generation of the students in these classes today because they really get it. They know the science, they're excited. They have a powerful voice, they're using that. We have million kid marches in cities around the world and it's been so exciting to see uh, the kids in, the, in these students' classes really take up the mantle of, of change. And so uh, I couldn't, I again, think of a better message. Rochelle, thank you so, so much for joining us today. I, I really appreciate you capstoning both my year with Exploring by the Seat Your Pants and our Oceans Week extravaganza. I want to note for everyone, again, if you want to check out the whole Ocean Week Canada series, the link is below. And Ocean Week generally across uh, Canada, hundreds of events resources, hubs, and so much more, oceanweekcan.ca. Uh, Rochelle, thank you for this special program and uh, keep up the neat work. And I look very forward to reading all your books. <laughs> thanks so much, Jesse. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, it was nice to see you and be with you. And I uh, look forward to staying in touch and seeing your ripples. Awesome. Have a wonderful day.